2. The Lord, when he walked on earth, fulfilling his missionary activities, was often surrounded and met by women. You know all of that famous conversation he had with the Samaritan woman, which we will commemorate in a few weeks' time. And she became a great missionary worker amongst the Samaritans, having come to know the theology directly from Christ's mouth. Where were his men? Where were the apostles? He went off to get food supplies. And there he was by himself speaking to them. When he was arrested, the women were there. Where were the men? They ran off except for the young John, the theologian, the future theologian. And for a while, Peter, but the moment Peter was challenged about his belief, he denied Christ thrice, and he too ran away. The women stayed. When he was carrying his cross, it was the women that came up to him and gave him some comfort by wiping the sweat and the blood from him, leaving the image of the one not made with hands that you have seen, that particular icon, the miraculous thing that the Lord gave to us so that we would always have an image of him when he was already on the cross in the um, Golgotha. The women were there. Where were the men? They ran off or were seeing things from a distance, too scared to come close. His mother never left him. Even when he was put in his tomb, his mother there, even though that's not mentioned in scripture, such we know from the writing of the Holy Fathers, so that's the way it was. Then they prepared for him the proper rite of burial according to the Jews, with the aloes and the spices and the um, linen. There was no time to do it properly, so they said that they would come straight after the sepulchre when the sun had risen. And indeed, they came in different groups. If you read the Gospels, it seems like there's a contradiction. There's one group coming, then another group coming. But it was like that because they didn't all come together. They came in different groups, slightly different times. Not afraid of the Roman soldiers or the Sanhedrin that kept their watch, um, trying to make sure that nobody stole the body. Mary Magdalene, of course, as you know, saw a person who she thought was the gardener and asked where he had put Christ's body. She did not recognise him until he spoke to her. And then she tried to embrace him, but he wouldn't let her because she did not yet understand what had happened. The young John, the theologian, was the only one that sort of was brave enough to go in see all these things for himself. Peter only came later. And you notice what um, the women were asked to say by the angel. He said, Behold the place where they laid him. Go and say to his disciples and to Peter. So why did he add, and to Peter? Because Peter denied him thrice. He was no longer a disciple. So he had to be singled out that he would have to be told separately, which he was. And hence, we see that the women surround him quite often, and as we see even in our times, holy men, spiritual fathers and mothers, often surrounded by women. Why? Why is that? We have the whole feast day dedicated to that on this the um, third Sunday of Pascha, the day of the Samaritan women, the myrrh-bearing women, or if you like, the Mother's Day of Orthodoxy. That's what it is, Mother's Day of Orthodoxy, where the women are particularly honoured and glorified.
because many of these women became great missionary workers. We call them equal to the apostles. Equal to the apostles. Certainly in orthodoxy, in our Synexarians, the lives of the saints, we can read a lot about them. And I think the orthodox um, are probably the only ones that do have a lot about these sorts of things because they are so important. So why is this such an emphasis all of a sudden upon women? You notice that in orthodoxy we don't have this problem, um, the role of women in the church. We don't have that problem. Or if we do, it's only because somebody didn't understand it. But in other so-called Christian confessions, we do see this issue coming up. To understand this, we have to go back right to the time of creation, to Genesis. For a ladder made from dust, clay, the earth. He found no comfort with the other creatures that were brought to him by the Lord did not find anything in common. So the Lord caused sleep to fall upon him, took a rib and fashioned a woman just for him. So he's clay, sorry, dirt, but she is made already out of flesh, human flesh. Holy Father say that puts her on a higher level, a new type of And this height gives her special faculties which the men did not have. But, but, here's the big um, issue. When I was travelling through Romania and we had a nice family that we stayed with, their daughter, a university student, <coughs> was driving us around. And she asked this question about women in the church. Particularly, why can't they um, preach or become priests or bishops? Whatever. And I said, well, well, haven't your priests told you? She said, well, yeah, but it didn't really make enough sense. So I only repeated to her what we had learned from our own spiritual fathers. The women had this propensity for understanding spiritual life better than the men. Because of that particular gift, the demonic powers focused on her in that Garden of Eden. And she entered into conversation. You have to remember that it was Adam that was given the commandment about the tree and the avoidance of certain fruit, but not her specifically from the Lord. And those very clever demonic powers noticed this and tempted her, why don't you partake of this particular fruit? Instead of brushing this creature away, she went into conversation, saying that if we did that, we'd die. Now, how strange is that? person who has eternal life is immortal, is talking about death. They don't have no idea what death is. You know, to them it's just a word. And of course there's the catch that caught her and convinced to partake of this fruit because this demonic power said that you will become like God and he doesn't want you to know that. He doesn't want you to be like that. Total opposite happened of course. So you see that because she was not yet, neither was Adam, fully trained in spiritual life, it was very easy to deceive, particularly if you have a propensity for spiritual life, particularly if you can understand that much better than the men. And until you acquire that spiritual faculty of discerning what is right and what is wrong, it can be very easy to deceive. That's one reason why the church chose not to allow women to preach like during liturgy or to become um, ordained, etc. 
except for the deaconesses. Of course, the other reasons are many. Should I mention what men are thinking about if they see a woman at the pulpit or anywhere like that? You know yourself the situation. She was made where? Rib around his heart. You can't escape that. You know what I mean? Rib around your heart. And therefore, there is already this great attraction, no matter who that is. So if she tries to talk about something spiritual and important, what I mean thinking, looking and thinking about other things. See how wise the um, way the church has been organised. Of course, they have a great job to do in bringing up children and also in the missionary work. Mother of God never left the apostles for several decades after the ascension of the Lord, after Pentecost, but went in various travels herself, um, spreading the good news. And this became a whole set of saints that we call equal to the apostles. Some of them evangelised whole nations, like Nina, equal to the apostle, evangelised the nation of Georgia. Olga, the grandmother of St. Vladimir, essentially brought orthodoxy to the Slavs before St. Vladimir chose that as the faith of the people overall. And we could go on and on. These ones that we mentioned, like Salome and um, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, what a brave person she was. She even took the Paschal red egg and went to see Caesar and greeted him with Christ his risen in Jerusalem at the um, monastery of Mary Magdalene. There's a huge fresco icon of her standing before Caesar giving him this egg. And it's a, it's a marvellous thing when you see the missionary work that she performed. So to us, to the Orthodox, this idea of women, women's role is not an issue with us because they're fully there in their capacity as they were created to be more spiritual, to understand things quicker than the men, and they're hence to teach children that and others that might need it, but not to appear in public as um, some sort of entity that's pushed out to preach and whatever. Not very long ago I got a call from a Greek young lady. She had some particular question and we got on to the topic of confession. All of a sudden out of the blue she says to me, don't preach to me, don't preach to me. I can, I'm, I'm going to be doing anything I like and when I feel that I'm going to die then I'll go and do confession. You can see the ridiculous idea behind that, right? Don't, I'm going to do anything I like and then when I think I'm going to die I'll go and confess. Well, we know the sort of results that ha happened there. The Greek Orthodox lady telling us that um, she will know when she's going to die and she's going to go and confess. Confess what? She would have forgotten 99.9% .9 of all the things that she had done anyway to confess by that time. Why is this? All of a sudden, when we talk about confession, and in particular, keeping the commandments, right? I talk to a lot of people, and I tell them about keeping the commandments, how important it is. The moment you say that, keeping the commandments, it's like this steel door comes down, bang! How can I wriggle my way out of that? Is there a part in scripture where I can wriggle out of keeping the commandments? Or the Holy Fathers? Have they said anything about that? Is there another way? Is there? Well, there isn't. There isn't. Everything we do in the church is based upon that. If you want to grow spiritually, you keep the commandments. If you want to become holy, you keep the commandments. If you want to get into paradise, you keep the commandments. And I don't mean the ten that Moses handed down to us. What we mean are those, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven, 
Let us let it mourn, for they shall be comforted. Plus all the numerous ones that Christ gave us, one of the most important. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. That's a commandment. You know? If you love me, Christ said, you will keep my commandments and my Father and I will come and find our abode in me. That's the result, the holiness that comes from that. Keep the commandments. But people tend to find, or want to find ways to wriggle out of it. And there are whole so-called denominations that have even dogmatised ways of not keeping the commandments. The Vatican has invented this purgatory thing that I've mentioned to you many times before. This mythical place where a person goes and gets purified. So they can live the life any way they like here on earth. They'll go into this purgatory when they die and they come out pure. Don't worry about the great judgment. You don't need that anymore. So there's one way of wriggling out. Or indulgences. If you don't know what indulgences are, there's various ways you can pay up in your life in, to have your sins forgiven. Nowhere is that ever mentioned anywhere. You can't buy your way into the kingdom of heaven at all. But the only way you can get there is by keeping the commandments, all of them. And it's not possible to keep the commandments unless you're part of the church, because the church teaches you how to keep them. Plus it tells you what the commandments are. You can't just pull them out of the air, you know. People have all these different faiths today, you know, Buddhists and Muslims and all these sort of things. And they say, gee, you know, there's a lot of similarities between Christianity and that. Well, there isn't at all. Whatever good those departments have, is all comes from Christianity. It doesn't come from them. They have given us nothing new in the sphere of commandments at all. What they've taken is that which God has given us and um, adjusted it somehow to sound as if it's coming from them. But it's not. It's all God-giving. Because only good can come out of God and no, from nowhere else at all. It's sort of like strange to even think differently. Where else could you get goodness from except from God himself, who is perfect goodness? And therefore, for us it's very important what is happening on these weeks after Pascha is we are now in a state of grace, which we didn't have during Holy Week because of the resurrection. And that state of grace now assists us in keeping the commandments, which we didn't have before. If you remember that one of the works that Christ had to do was to go to Hades to pull out the righteous ones there, the righteous ones who were in Hades because before grace came, everybody went there, good and bad and he had to um, redeem them as well as those who he redeemed on earth through the new covenant and therefore that grace has opened up to us the possibility of sanctity, which we see in all the saints that we have. And none of them came into this sanctity without keeping the commandments, without sacrificing the pleasures, the decadent pleasures of this life for following Christ, for keeping his commandments. Every time I put the cross on, I have to say it. If you wish to follow me, pick up your cross and come follow me. In other words, pick up the difficulties that you have, thank the Lord for that, and follow him without any despondency or any misgivings, because those difficulties and um, the correct approach to them is part of keeping the commandments. Wherever you look, keep the commandments. And there's no other way. If you ever find another way, let us know, because all the Holy Fathers... And all the people for 2,000 years, millions of saints, declare that and only that in the Orthodox Church, in the true Church, and nothing more. Time is really moving on, and um, we are soon <coughs> going to be in mid-Pentecost, halfway through this Paschal period.
period. And we still have the commemoration of the paralytic on a Sunday and the Samaritan woman whom we just mentioned before. Um, before the 50th day that we have after ascension, 10 days after the ascension, the um, bringing down of the church to the earth and evangelizing these poor men that fled when they saw their master arrested and crucified. Remember, the most of them fishermen, uneducated, not really understanding the um, niceties of theology, were enlightened with the Pentecost period through the Holy Spirit and became master theologians. And so it had to be, otherwise how could they go into the rest of the world and preach? What would they say if they didn't have that? You know, you go to some country and you start preaching Christ. And people ask you a question, you don't know how to answer. What kind of evangelization is that? We, of course, as Orthodox Christians, one of the commandments we have to know is to be able to do the same sort of thing. Not on a great um, level necessarily, but in our own small way, with our families, with our children, with our friends, our neighbours, and anybody else that gets put in front of us asking about why we are so joyous at Pascha. Why are we so enlightened by all these things that are happening? Well, it's because of that. Grace has been given. Um, death has been absolved. Paradise is open if you keep the commandments or if you strive to keep the commandments because many of them are certainly hard. But as I've said to you on many other occasions, don't give up. Make Christ give us that strength never to ever give up, no matter what. And whether it looks um, sloppy in your life, you know, unorganised, and doesn't fall into the sort of nice um, schedule and nice little boxes that we often want to have in the world, that doesn't matter because the spiritual life is not of this world and it doesn't fit into that sort of worldly organisation. It just does not fit. We could tell you about some of the holy people that we have seen and how they serve, for example, and how they behave. And unless you know what's happening, it can be scandalous. But <laughs> what they are showing to you is that the foolishness of this world is not worth the um, glory that occurs through the grace and the heavenly 